this evening our, our topic is uh, the pond, very simply, um, a small body of water. We can argue uh, at length about what's the difference between a pond, a pool and a lake, uh, and I think they're just degrees of size. Um, and certainly uh, the difference between a brook and a river is you can leap across a brook, um, you tend to swim across a river. Um, with ponds, um, you can swim across them. Um, leaping across a pond is, is a different matter. So you can swim across them, but probably if you fell in and stretched yourself out completely, you should possibly be able to touch the other side. Um, so there, there tend to be small features. Um, later on, I will touch on the presence of fish but they tend to occupy much larger bodies of water. So it's probably where we, we start to talk about fish that we start to get the difference between a wildlife pond and a, and a pool and a lake. They start to be slightly bigger. Anyway, so we're gonna think about creating a pond. Um, before that, I want to just plant a seed in everybody's mind uh, about how we, how we look at the natural world. And one of the, my favorite little words, words is umwelt. And it's a German word. It's coined by, that's right, Jörg. It's coined by a German ecologist, a guy called Jürgen, no, Johann Haeckel. And Umwelt is a, is a way to describe the way that we as animals, we are animals, we tend to be quite sophisticated ones, but we're animals all the same, is our worldview. How do we perceive the sensory things that make up our world? Um, and one of the ways that we, we impose ourselves upon the world is we only see it from the human, the, the Homo sapiens umwelt. Whereas I want us to just explore and to think through this evening about the, the, the umwelt of a crane fly, the umwelt of a lesser water boatman, the umwelt of a mink, of an otter, a water vole, a heron. Their worldview is completely different from ours and what they need from the world to feel secure and safe is also different from us. And I think the difference in terms of a pond from us is rather than viewing ponds uh, as, as, as the brush strokes of a capability brown, an addition, a, an aesthetic addition, is we need to think of them as places where wildlife live and wildlife have a different view of this place than we do. They don't expect it to be a big wide open expanse of water. They're not comfortable with that, that leaves them open to predation. They need shelter, they need foraging, they need variety. And sometimes the most battered and neglected pond from our point of view is actually the most biodiverse and the most rich. So it's just something to think about as we go through this evening. So kicking off the first half, why do we create ponds? Why do we, we cherish them? It's because they just throw up opportunities um, for creatures like these. And this is a really obvious set of of stuff that if you're a, a child, uh, it's a four year old, this is what you associate your pond with. It would have snails in that you could pick up and stick on your hand. It would have the clatter of, of this, of a large dragonfly. Their, their wings are quite fragile and they make an awful lot of noise when you're close up to them, battering around. This is a, a broad bodied um, a chaser, just a lit on a leaf. It's got a, a it's actually a, a, a black tail skimmer, that particular one. We've got a common frog on the top left, um, really precocious things. They like a pond of any size. They're, they lay their spawn in a puddle if they wish. On the bottom right, we have a, a smooth newt. And on the left, we have a lesser water boatman. They fly. They're really quite aggressive as well. They will give you quite a nasty nip. But they will find a body of water really, really easily. Uh, and ponds will support this quite simple array of life. This is the most obvious, um, easy, observable section, cross section I could think of just to chuck on one slide to go, pond, that's what it means. These are the sorts of things that can arrive there. So we've got a piece of land. Um, we're going to start to think about how we create a, a pond on it. Um, and we're going to start working through some decisions. Now, do we want a pond? or actually after, we're after somewhere where we want fish, um, or do we want this body of water to supply us? Is it a reservoir? Are, are we storing up water? Um, when we get our water, we've got to think about, can we change the water in it? Once we fill our pond up, 
the water needs to be protected if we're to keep it clean. Uh, and upon the water, 12,000 litres plus or whatever, we can't change it very easily. So when we start to fill our pond or allow it to be filled, um, how do we manage that water quality? So are we feeding it from a ditch? Is there a stream that we can redirect? Or are we going to allow the rainfall to do it? And my, my point of view is we need to let nature fill our pond, our hole in the ground uh, and in the most natural way. Can the water be lifted out to a trough? Um, are we feeding livestock with our pool? Most of the many, many pools in, in Shropshire, in the, in the landscape around us, were excavated to provide drinking spots for livestock. Not quite a necessary requirement these days. Um, unfortunately, the water in most ponds isn't clean enough for uh, cattle or sheep to drink anyway. It tends to have zoonosis in um, and, and bugs and bacteria that really the livestock shouldn't be drinking. But if you were going to create it for livestock, can you extract it? What would happen if it dries up? Now, interestingly, a lot of research is showing that actually ponds that are ephemeral, that dry up, tend to support much rarer and a more unusual assemblages, groupings, communities of aquatic wildlife than ponds that are there all the time. Kind of a dimension of that, that stressful environment when it dries up a lot of uh, common aquatic in, uh, in wildlife and species just don't survive. Those are much more robust or specialized, can cope with those conditions, uh, will come back and survive. If we combine fish with amphibians, um, apparently frog spawn's really tasty. From the point of view of a fish, they love tadpoles, they're great. Um, herons will eat them, lots of other predators will eat tadpoles. Even dragonfly larvae will eat tadpoles. So if we combine fish and amphibians, we we're already create a, a sort of a tussle in our food chain that maybe will be to a disadvantage of what we're trying to achieve. So in some, with this kind of first step around, am I, am I after fish or am I after amphibians and another more sort of smaller wildlife? Um, and there's lots of decisions to be made there. Now this evening, we're not gonna talk about fishery management particularly. Um, that is a huge topic um, and probably um, should have a, a, an evening of its own, certainly with, with people that know a little bit more about fisheries management, um, quite complex. So moving on, let's have a look. This is a, um, one of our reserves, the nature reserves of Melbourne Meadows. It's a site of special scientific interest. And last year, no, 2009 actually, 19, um, I spent a sort of long afternoon having a look at the ponds at Melvilly Meadows, of which there's many, and they make up a community of ponds, They're kind of like a neighbourhood, a pond neighbourhood, if you will. And each pond was in a slightly different stage of succession. I, it was either very, very wet and open water, or it was slowly becoming a dry spot. It was filling in, it was accumulated, or some of them, like the one on the top right, because it has been very wet, this is sort of late, let's have a look, yep, sort of late winter, that was actually a contemporary pond. I knew that wasn't going to be there by the time I got to the end of February. It was quite a large body of water. Um, it was a very interesting body of water and it tended to occupy a very shallow basin, but it wasn't a permanent pond. Whereas the top left used to be a pond, but like uh, John Lewis Stempel says, Lots of ponds are sort of driven to commit suicide over time. They just slowly accumulate leaf litter, silt, sediment, um, bits of dying organic matter, and they slowly fill up and stop being ponds and they become a, a damp patch in, in the landscape. Other ponds at Melvilly have got quite a lot of vegetation in, but if you walked on the vegetation, you sink up to your waist. So they're still a lot of water there but it's covered with a, a, a complete covering of, of vegetation and other ponds were open i didn't take photographs of those obviously there's far too many ponds to fit in one slide but it's interesting when you're looking at an amphibian population like newts um, or toads or frogs is actually they will travel from pond to pond they won't occupy 
one pond in continuity in year after year. The offspring might just wander off and find another pond. And if one pond stops being suitable, then they've got other ponds. And this in ecological sense, it's called a metapopulation. So our newts in this area are reliant on a network of ponds. And it's quite interesting when you're planning your ponds is to think about my pond in the landscape. So if I put in a new pond here, where are the other ponds next door, over the fence, down the lane, along the hedge? How connected is my pond going to be? So we're starting to think the location, where are we going to put our ponds? And we're looking at our location in detail. Soil type. We had a pond that we worked on over the last year and we were really concerned because the soil was just so sandy. We put in a dip well, two metre plastic pipe down into the ground. We had a cane, bamboo cane, and we measured it on a monthly basis along with the landowner, John. And we worked out that actually the, the groundwater was quite close to the surface. So our fears that the sandy soil was going to drain all the water away weren't realized because what the sandy soil allowed the water to do was to rise up in through it to sit really really high just under the surface of the soil so soil type is quite interesting and one of the simplest ways of testing is to dig a set of test pits across your patch uh, two spits deep a spit is a is the size of a, a spade so one of those plus another one of those you can fill it with let's say two buckets of water and you've got a stopwatch and you just time to see how long it takes to drain away and you do that over a few months period just to see what's your soil going to do do i need to line this to create my new pond or is the soil actually so wet that i can just dig a, dig a natural um, basin uh, and i'm all, all ready to go and allow rainwater to fill it up another part of your decision making one of the, the habitats that's declined um, in colossal sort of percentages over the last uh, 50 to 60 years are wildflower rich grasslands um, and wet woodlands. So if we've got a location that's got a habitat that actually is really quite valuable anyway, do we want to put a pond in it? Could we put the pond to one side and we've again in the last year we've done 17 ponds and we've come up all against all of these scenarios and one of them we decided to put the pond at the end of the wetland so you got the wetland was intact and we added a pond to it rather than putting a pond in the middle of the wetland and losing some wetland you know i've got to get sort of cost benefit going on here is the location at risk of spray drift or nutrient pollution so some of you this evening will be in, in towns or villages within, in Shrew, within Shropshire and spray, agricultural spray drift may not be an issue. We lived in Kent, our garden backed onto a large arable field and spray drift was an issue. And we used to have to drag the children back inside the house when we could see that they were spraying to avoid them being pesticides. They were pests anyway, but we didn't want them to be eradicated by an unfortunate pollution incident. Um, Another issue that may be more pertinent is nutrient. So you might be tempted to connect your new pond location with a ditch that runs with water, but just have a think about where does that come from? Is somebody's septic tank discharging into the upstream? And then rolling down, we got terrestrial habitat. That's the land that surrounds it. And I will come back to this a few times is our amphibians, let's take our common frog for instance, will only use a pond for a couple of months for the breeding season. They lay the spawn in, they hang around a little bit, muck about a little bit. By June, the adults have gone, the toadlets and, and froglets are all starting to sprout legs and they're, eventually they will crawl out of the pond. And for the other part of the year, they'll be out there in rough grasslands, piles of dead wood, in the leaf litter, in the shrubby bits of the back of the garden. So the terrestrial habitat is actually the other half of the pond and you need both for the pond to work. Unless it's um, an ornamental pond, it's very formal, 
Um, you might be keeping uh, koi carp, which are fascinating. We had an old neighbor of ours kept koi, um, and absolutely gorgeous and beautiful creatures. And uh, But it was a very different pond from, from primarily a pond that's there for wildlife. We've already mentioned connections. We need to connect that pond into the landscape. We do want to attract wildlife. We want it to be buzzing um, and fertile and productive and supporting lots of things. We need to just connect it gently together. We need to think about the future. If we're planning to expand the built bits of our garden, if you've got a shed or a polytunnel or whatever, uh, I'll give you a good sort of close up example. We've got a pond in our garden. Um, I, I discovered, I was told actually, the other day that this is exactly where the new chicken run is going to go. And why didn't I think of that in the first place? Hey, I'm just going to have to dig another hole somewhere. Um, if Can I get to the pond location if I need to maintain it in the future? Have I got, if it's quite a large, robust pond, can I get a small digger in if I might need to, to rectify a problem uh, and adjust it? Um, can I see it? You know, part of the pleasure of a pond is having it there so you can enjoy it uh, and be close to it. That deck chair popped out, floppy hat, sun hat on, by the pond with a cup of tea or something a bit stronger. And the question about a restored pond, does it actually have value that will be lost if it's re-excavated? So it might be doing a lot of work already, some value there, but it, you can't see open water on it. It may actually be something different. And then finally on this particular one, where's the spoil go? That's quite a lot of do uh, soil you're gonna dig out. Where's it gonna go? Can it, if it goes off site, you may have to pay more for it to go off site. If you leave it on site, do you end up creating an unfortunate sort of unnatural mound in the garden or is that a great place to put the slide for the kids? Don't know, but it's, it's again, you need to think about it. You're inverting a large lump of soil and it needs to go somewhere appropriate so that your pond a year or two later looks like it was always there. Something to think about. So just a little sort of case study really is on the left hand side, we have some old degraded collapsed willows there's a shallow little patch. It's at the bottom of a, a large field. There's water runs down the field. And at some point there was a pond here, but it's slowly filled up. So on the right hand side, we had a lovely team from Cashmore Contracting came in working with Guy, the landowner. Um, we excavated the pond, connected into the this field drains. You can see that the copper stumps of the willow, so they will grow again. We also seeded it up with some tussock grass mix to make sure that we got some good terrestrial habitat. And we fenced the livestock out to create a real hotspot for wildlife. What we didn't realize was somewhere in there, there's a, there's a drainage problem. And this filled up really quickly, but also by early spring, it had emptied again. Um, so we had a bit of a challenge trying to work out why that was so. Um, and I think we fixed it, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to go back shortly. But it wasn't the expected outcome. We thought, fantastic, we've got a pond sorted. But there's something not quite right with, with the, the, the ground there. So again, there's, there's just a warning there from sort of, you can do all the, the planning, but there's sometimes there's little sort of shocks and surprises along the way. Okay, so we need land around it. Amphibians only need the pond for their breeding season, but you can compensate for that by creating rough grass and connections, log stacks, um, planting hedgerows, making sure the hedgerow bottom has got lots of material in it, um, or you've got a tiny patch of woodland or a couple of trees, and you might need to, to fence to protect your pond from um, livestock, if you're in a farming situation, um, you might need to fence because of safety considerations. So you may have small children, and you think actually I might need to just create a bit of a, a, a special enclosure for this pond. So as the children get older, they're less at risk, they're more aware of, of safety, and they can still enjoy the benefits of having a pond, 
but you might want to do that as well. So here's an example of an addition. This is at um, uh, a farm down in uh, New Invention at the bottom of the county. Lovely pond restoration project underway. Um, and the guys are very kindly agreed to add some high vernacular. So high vernacular, as you can see, top left, a uh, load of branches and brash put in a pile, covered in spoil from the pond excavation, but there's access. So if you look at the main picture, there's still access for animals, a whole range of animals to climb into those spaces in that brash pile and hibernate um, or gain refuge or whatever. So really nice addition to, to the pond. So it's in, enhancing the terrestrial habitat by adding this special place there. And I remember a couple of years ago, um, over at um, Dot Hill Local Nature Reserve, joined some, some children with work in there. They dug a, a very shallow hole near some of uh, one of the larger ponds, put loads of brash and sticks in, and then covered the, 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 the pile with turves that they cut from somewhere else to create this high vernacular, which supports, as I say, not only amphibians, but a whole range of, of animals, including small mammals and um, bugs, beasts and fungi um, will occupy that. Really nice and not very expensive. Great addition to a, a pond scheme. So it's not entirely necessary for your pond to hold water all year round, um, but at least from that sort of winter period, that sort of early autumn through to midsummer. Um, it's not necessary to top your pond up. Uh, and certainly if you are going to top it up, is if you can use rainwater from a, 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 a water butt, that's by far the better. The chemical quality of that water is in balance with what's in the pond. Um, treat, treated tap water tends to have a much higher level of nutrients and it also has a range of chemical additives, which means it is drinkable. It's also not pretty wasteful. It's expensive producing drinking water. Uh, and rain, as it has done today, has filled my pond up quite happily, thank you very much, free of charge from the clouds above. Um, I've talked about water courses. Just be very careful if you're going to connect your new pond into an existing set of water courses, because you may not have any control about the quality of where that water comes from or the quantity it comes from. So sometimes it's better for a, a pond to be a self-contained um, basin rather than uh, part of an inline system. Um, rainfall, so I mentioned the rainfall and with water quality, I've got, I have a very simple kit and I, I can check pH, uh, temperature. Um, I look for nutrient values. I'm looking for alarms around ammonia content um, and um, things like uh, phosphates. So nutrients, if they're in, in excess, will tend to cause a, a, a sort of a blooming of aggressive plants that you don't want in your pond. They also tend to therefore create an organic loading in the pond. And when it gets warm and the plants die, they will, they will strip the oxygen out of the water. So nutrient levels need to be as low as possible. Um, and again, that's why rainfall, um, which is pH sort of what's it, 6.5, so it's slightly acidic, tends to but it's, it's not very acidic. So it tends to buffer things and keeps nutrients much lower. So simple to water quality testing kit um, is a good idea if you want to maintain and, and understand your, your pond and what it's up to. Or you can use invertebrates. So um, this, this is a visual aid, is the Freshwater Name Trail. It's a uh, Field Studies Council handbook it's glossy so it's waterproof up to a point don't drop it in the river um, if you collect a gang of bugs from your water from your pond put them in a tray with about an inch of water in and then count the species and then there's a little formula on the back of the document that allows you to work out what they call a biotic index uh, and it's a number very simple so you have your total number of species they don't need to be identified any more than, oh, that's um, a freshwater shrimp. That's cool. That's got a value in terms of how tolerant it is of pollution or not. 
Mayfly are not very tolerant, so they, they score very high. Uh, your freshwater shrimps are um, quite tolerant, so they're, they're kind of a mid-range score. Tot up that and it will give you an average score um, between zero and 10. Uh, and that will give you an idea of, of how your pond's doing. It's a really nice way of, of getting involved in measuring your pond value in terms of the range of, of aquatic invertebrates it's supporting and remembering that those are part of the, the, the food chain for that. And in the second half of the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about specific invertebrates and animals that you'd measure in that way. So formal bit around planning is you may need to require planning permission for your pond. Um, you may need to consult with people, depends on your circumstance. Now, if, you, if you're putting a tiny pond in your back garden, I won't worry about natural England. I don't think they'd be get overly excited. Um, but if you are planning a pond restoration and you had obvious protected species in your pond and you kind of knew they were there uh, and you got a bit of advice from people like ourselves, then you might need to get a bit more formal advice about how to to do the work that you're planning. And I think that's that tends to be time well spent. Um, finding protected species is actually, I think it's an amazing thing to find them because we, we, we get bombarded with tales that, that species wildlife is in huge decline. Um, but every day somebody comes to me and says, oh, I've got this in my pond. You go, really? That's fantastic. That's really good news. Uh, and finding out more about how to look after those that wildlife that you clearly are, are harboring and nurturing in your back garden is really quite exciting rather than a burden. I think it's a, a learning process that's, that's great. So, oh, underground overhead service. So I will pull out that one. Um, it tends to be that um, they're very poorly mapped if you've got an underground services. So it might be a drains or a power cable or whatever. And it does pay you to spend a little bit of time finding out where your cable goes that, that helps support the broadband for your village before you cut through it. I know just a, a little warning there in terms of planning. Um, On to spoil. There are some really nice calculators online to help you understand the volumes of irregular shapes. So I use them quite a lot because I'm, I'm sort of numerically dyslexic. So I go and put that in there. Oh, thank you very much. That's great. I've got certain cubic meters of spoil. What's that going to look like? Um, can I dispose of it really easily? Um, and then we recently we did some work on gin operation, not much different from a restoration of a pond. And we needed to test the spoil just in case it, it contained contaminants of one sort. And we needed to change our handling. Um, we also worked on another place where we had some Japanese knotweed, which is a notifiable plant, and we needed to work with the right skip company so that could be taken away safely. So we didn't move the hazard from one site and just pop it somewhere else. So a little bit of work around that, and I'm sure you know, people like ourselves are available to, to do our best to offer advice and support. Floodplain sites are interesting. Uh, you'd think that would be quite a nice, easy check, but if we dig a hole in, in a floodplain, one, we do create uh, a space for flood waters to go. If we leave our pile of soil and spoil on a floodplain, we actually might actually create a flood hazard. So, you know, mm, okay, so taking a bit of advice about that sort of location. And again, there's sort of permits and exemptions, but again, we can, we can help out with a bit of advice around those. They're not bars. They're about helping us to make good, sensible, wise decisions that means that our pond is a permanent feature of the landscape because it's in the right place, it's been considered uh, and it's a sensible decision to do the right thing. Um, and I did mention the mounding. I've seen some pond sites where you just know it's, it was an artificial thing where with a bit of care, you can really create a, a brand new pond that within a couple of years looks like it's been there forever. And nature will do all the soft stuff. Um, it's up to us to do the hard engineering in, in, in a sensitive way. Okay, so give yourself time to have a think about it. Um, if you've got an existing pond, 
you need to do a bit of survey work now um, and plan that. And that's exciting in itself, I say, with, with nets and books um, to do that. And then the, the season of opportunity is in the late summer and autumn. So the, any works around the pond, whether it's maintenance or creation or restoration, it's that sort of September up to Christmas is the optimum time. The ground conditions tend to be good for excavation. If you've got a heavy machine moving around, you're not working on soft ground. You're minimizing disturbance to, to and animals that are there already. They've all fin already finished their breeding cycle. Um, and it means you're avoiding that post Christmas where the ground is in dreadful condition. It shouldn't be driven on at all. Um, and also you're avoiding that early summer stuff where the pond even if it's in a degraded state, it's still doing loads and loads of really exciting work for wildlife. So this is a, again, this is why we, we asked for, or suggest a year really. We've got a set of four ponds here, each of which look to be in quite advanced succession. You know, they're slowly turning to soft ground, but we need to think carefully about how we manage them. The pond on the top left, um, the reed mace there uh, has taken over. It's got a thick, heavy rhizome as its root system and will spread and will dominate. So here you can say, well, actually, if I get a machine in, I can remove about a third of that in the late um, summer, take that off to one side, allow all the bugs and beasts that are depend on it to crawl back in. Year two, I'll come back and I'll remove another section. Year three, I'll do a little bit more. And I think the my my favorite approach is you look at these as long-term projects. You do a little bit at a time, you allow the pond to recover, and then you do a little bit more. Um, the overall reworking of a pond can cause more harm than, than it does. But some ponds are obviously in an advanced state. So the bottom right picture, I think, no, that's heavily shaded. There's no aquatic plants at all. Um, I could probably do quite a robust job on that one and, and actually re restore it completely and then leave it for 10 years to do its thing, just popping back to enjoy it every now and then. The other two, they're kind of marginal, um, top right, need to leave that deadwood there or just push it to one side and recover some water. Deadwood tends to be a fantastic surface for all sorts of creatures to stick on. Um, whether it's bacteria or fungi, uh, a lot of uh, aquatic invertebrates and, and others will plant, will lay their eggs onto dead wood in, 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 in ponds like that. So a pond has got to have a certain level of untidiness. So both of the ponds, bottom left and top right, have got dead wood in that's probably carrying a, a kind of a reservoir or a refuge for some really interesting stuff. So just pushing that to one side, recovering a bit of depth, reducing tree shading. There's good prescriptions for, for those ponds there. So it's, so what I'm trying to, to describe is a process between identifying the restored pond or the pond that requires some help and assistance. So this, this is quite dramatic and then recovery. So this was done in one dramatic operation, but it's been allowed to recover. Now I'd argue that that needs a lot more terrestrial habitat, but it is connected off to that left-hand side into that woodland and that coppice willow will regrow and it is connected to a hedge. So maybe I'm being a bit unfair. So that's, so from the, the human unveil, from the human point of view, you've got a lovely pond, um, possibly the wildlife connections at the back, but I. I prefer it to be a little bit stronger, a bit wilder, a bit untidier, but it's, it's not too bad. But that's the process from the, the dried up, almost gone pond to the restored pond that's ready for another 20 years or 30 years or so. Shading. So overshaded ponds will not have aquatic plants in terms of emergent plants. So whether that's for, for fish to, to hide in um, whether fish fry, whether it's for dragonflies, for their larvae to climb up and then um, they, you know, crack open and fly off. There's none of that connection between the aquatic environment 
uh, and the aerial environment. So you don't need to remove all the trees. So generally it's from the, the southern side is where the sun comes from, we're in the northern hemisphere. And one little sort of note of caution here is if you're going to use a chainsaw in relate close to water is to put a sheet down to capture the chain oil uh, and the other mineral oils associated with that particular machine. Uh, and a spot of oil from a, a chainsaw can just spread across the whole of the pond. Uh, and we all remember our primary school thing about that surface tension and it will destroy it. Uh, and a lot of the water measures, water crickets will, will drown quite simply. So a tiny little bit of measure around using either yourself as a competent individual, having to have a thought about where you're working in your own space, in your own garden, or making that specification to your contractor and say, look, you do know this is a, an aquatic environment. You know, are you using uh, biodegradable oils? How are you going to protect the surface and water quality of my pond and the wildlife that's in it? So tree work is important. And also, yeah, you may be tempted to take some of that away for firewood. Um, but also you can leave it quite a lot of it behind in wood stacks. The brash can be just scattered, crate to high vernacular as we've seen. There's a load of things you can do with that. So is a, a little sort of summary prescription for a small farmland wildlife pond or a, a garden wildlife pond. So minimum size about 10 meters by 10 meters. So that's, that's about enough to, to give you the volume of water to keep it going all the way through the year. In its deepest part, about a metre and a half of water. Um, doesn't need to be a metre and a half all over. It's got to have nice shelving sloping sides. Um, but in the winter, when a pond freezes, it will tend to strip out the oxygen. And sometimes in sort of January, February, you'll get um, fish uh, frog kills which comes from the fact that the water has uh, frozen and the available oxygen has declined to such a point that frogs that have been sheltering in the pond actually don't have enough to, to breathe. And they breathe through their skin, so um, they've got nothing left in there. So a minimum depth allows that, that, that survivability. Um, partial shading is okay. It's fantastic when they're not round or square. It's tempting to, to have a square thing, but um, a wild pond, um, a mere or uh, an old sort of marl pit tends to be a bit of a lumpy shape. So again, to go for natural, but if it's an ornamental pond, clearly if or it's a reflection pond or something, you know, interesting and aesthetic than that, then irregular is not the thing, but we're looking at wildlife. Open to the southern side and connected. This was a sketch plan for uh, a pond we put in for planning consent. Um, we secure planning consent on this um, sort of wobbly drawing. So again, planning consent isn't something to worry about. It, it's a process that allows us to make a good decision and justify it as well. Um, the, the last thing we want to do is, is create a pond that's in the wrong place that somebody in the future will fill in um, because it, it hasn't been planned out. Um, little, little discussion point is I, I tend and uh, certainly our funders tend to prefer ponds that are not lined. You can line a pond. Um, there's uh, butyl liners will last 20 to 25 years. Um, if you have a challenging sort of drainage problem or, or an issue, then lining it is, a, is a good way of doing that. Um, but they do come with issues. So if you can't cover the pond liner completely, and it, it's still exposed to sunlight, <coughs> then it will degrade, it will photo degrade in, in light. Um, and it does make maintenance really quite tricky. So a number of school ponds I've, I've helped out with, um, they had a liner and it got air underneath it. So it was kind of blown. Um, the liner got punctured. So we had to effectively dig another pond in order to remove everything into it. So they are vulnerable. Concrete um, has, has a, a, even a limited life cycle as well and will crack and extremely difficult to repair. But if you uh, puddle a pond, so you can um, get a contractor in or do it yourself, um, use puddling clay 
they're much easier to repair. You can drain the pond down and then just repuddle the, the break. Um, obviously, you need to make sure that they, they don't dry up because the, the clay will, will crack. Um, or you can use, there's another artificial clay, which I can't think of top of my head, um, but there's, there's a gray clay that can be laid out. You can buy it in rolls, it's extremely heavy, and that can be laid out and then pinched together uh, as an artificial liner. So it's, it's, not, it's not a no, it's a, it's just comes with a little bit of warning. It can make your pond project quite expensive. But also, one of the first ponds that we did when we moved to Shropshire um, was about the size of my desk. Uh, it was our Bill Oddie project. Um, we gave the kids 20 quid and said, right, here's your project, create a pond. Uh, and by the end of that summer, it was, it was teaming with newts that had found it. And it was an endless source of amusement. So, and it's a pond liner. We bought a, a cheap pond liner. It was good fun uh, and it did its thing. And, and the good old classic sort of butler's sink or Belfast sink uh, with a bit of access for your frogs and newts is, is also works well. Uh, as, as a small habitat. Um, so a few little comments about digging the hole um, is choose your machine carefully. You don't need to have a huge machine to do it. Sometimes some incompetent hands, a small mini digger is quite sufficient. Mark out your pond, um, check for wildlife and remove them before you start. So you can clear the ground if you're restoring. Um, and if you need to, you can over pump and also, again, this kind of long-term view <coughs> is you may have to come back and adjust the pond, despite having got the levels just as you think you need them. Um, there may have been a little shift and whatever. And sometimes designing particularly artificial ponds is getting your ledges in um, and, and fiddling around with it. So be expected, it's, it's, it's not just for Christmas, it's for life. Um, and also, you don't be too worried about it being untidy. This is a, a restoration project. Um, I was really delighted with this because the I persuaded my contractor on this on this occasion to be untidy, and they were, and that's exactly what I wanted them to be. Um, uh, and and that's the and I'm quite looking forward to going back to this one. It's got lots of holes and ruts and and all sorts of chaos going on. Um, superb spot. Really pleased with that one. So the question is always asked is, shall I plant and what plants, where shall I get them from? Now clearly there are colossal problems with invasive plants. Um, sadly, a lot of those have been supplied um, by aquatic nurseries that really should know better. They sell you it, they go, this is an oxygenating plant, fantastic. Two years later, it's the only plant you've got in your pond. Um, it's taken over. A lot of times, some of the simplest things to do is to find an existing pond close by, have a look at it, make sure it hasn't got any of the real nasties in, whether that's water weed or, or New Zealand stone crop, um, and you go, okay, that's cool, grab a bucket later on, particularly in sort of uh, mid midsummer, and then pour it into your own pond. But also go to a reputable um, supplier if you want to buy a marsh marigold for your pond, which are really nice and attractive, they do spread, but quite slowly. It's again, make sure that the, the substrate it comes in has also been either sterilized or been checked and cleaned. Because a lot of um, invasive plants will come in the tub that your quite new, exciting aquatic plant comes along. Now, most of us from the sort of wildlife trust will go buy native. Now that's not entirely necessary, as long as you're aware that if you're going to op fill your pond with exotics, and there are some really nice interesting ones out there, that they're not going to escape and cause a problem elsewhere. So you've got to make some choices again about um, protecting the wider environment if you're going to go some with something different and unusual, because um, garden escapes have been proven to be quite difficult to deal with in, in our native environments outside of the garden. But that doesn't say we can't have them. Um, and equally, our, our native invertebrates will find the pond uh, and won't really be bothered by the fact that this is a South African variety of reed mace rather than a European one. Um, so to, to plant or not to plant, I tend to favour for the wild is to allow the pond to recolonise naturally. 
and to enjoy the process of that happening and it will happen uh, plants will travel considerable distances particularly those that are airborne or carried on other creatures and that's quite an exciting thing though you may prefer to actually fix it and do a, a garden planting design and that, again that, that's okay too so just an example of a restoration project uh, this is Hill End Farm this is uh, over the last 12 months the pond uh, top left you can see the the valley as it was uh, the original pond the bund had breached um, but you can also appreciate there's a lot of water coming down into this catchment but it is flowing over a relatively extensively grazed field there's not too many livestock there they're sheep rather than cattle so um, our contractor Richard working with um, the gang there rebuilt the bund reinforced it because there's a lot of water comes down the hill and as you can see in the main picture it is slowly filling up and then yesterday I was sent or was it today I was sent this picture of a fantastic splash of frog spawn the frogs had found it this this pond was only finished um, back in last autumn you can also see there's blanket algae are growing there as well and I think I can see duckweed um, and there's a whole range I know that of diptera, sort of two winged flies that have already laid their, their eggs in the pond here. And there's um, a boatman as well, as I said earlier, boatman can fly. So this pond, even within a very short space of time with no additional planting uh, and, and not even with an, a bucket of stuff from another pond has already attracted some, some roaming uh, wildlife to take part. Um, and as we come to the end of this first section, this is Catherine's Pond. This is a lockdown pond. It's lined. It was built from scraps and bits and pieces that Catherine, one of my colleagues, got hold of um, from her friends and from the garden. And again, quite quickly, this is, this is not that long ago. These are photographs sent to me within the last couple of weeks. Uh, the lemna, the little duckweed, are busy occupying the surface of the pool. She's got adult frogs have found it, they've laid some spawn and she's got some uh, a smooth newt as well in the pond. Absolutely fantastic, really cheap um, and wonderful addition to, to Catherine's small garden there. Um, very inspiring, really pleased with that one. So that's the end of the first half. So that's how we put it together uh, and how we think about it. So I'm just going to have a good little drink. So why? Why are we doing all of this, this thinking, this planning, this scheming? And I, I bought some, I got my little, I bought this one years ago. Yes, absolutely years ago. I just checked the address in the front. Please return to, I am 57, but I, I have learned these lessons from primary school. This is my book. I put my name in it. I didn't cover it with uh, newspaper or anything now or magazine. Slightly more sort of learned book is Freshwater Life. So that's the Collins one in the middle. Absolutely fantastic, takes you on a much deeper journey. But the, the little Collins gem guys, I think are just superb. I've got a whole set of them for the natural world that I carry around. It's easy to fit in a pocket. Picked up the Pond and Stream Life, which was good fun. That was one when I, when I was buying secondhand books, I had to stop myself a couple of years ago because we ran out of shelving. And then recently, as you see, Still Water, The Deep Life of the Pond, John Lewis Stemple's book, beautifully written, uh, really intimate exploration of ponds and, and just being, um, I don't know, in tune with them and, and spending time. So a couple of books to guide you through. So how do we, how do we start making our journey? If we're, we're a complete beginner, we go, oh, ponds, I know they're great, what's going on there? And there's a couple of little principles that are quite nice to, to take on board to help you start identifying what's happening around your pond and why, why things are occurring in different places and what they might be. All ponds have got a, um, a kind of a transition from dry ground to open water and as we travel from dry ground to open water the plants that can tolerate the varying conditions will change and it's this kind of transition that helps go oh okay I've got it so on the dry bit I'm going to have 
trees, but I'm going to have trees that don't mind their feet in a little bit of water, a bit of wet soil. So my willows, my alders and stuff like that. When I get down to the wet margins, I'm going to encounter things like uh, flag iris, uh, water plantains, flowering rush. As it starts to get deeper or the water moves up and down, I'm going to get other plants uh, like bog bean, um, floating sweet grass that are quite happy either floating out from very shallow water onto the, uh, the, the deeper waters of the pond. But they certainly want to emerge. Most of the body of the plant is emerging above the water. The water gets deeper. The plants have to submerge. They can't reach the surface or they can just about get to the top and then they just float on the top or they're completely submerged under the water uh, wholly. So then we get further down into the deep. At a certain point, you go beyond what they call the photic level. So the photic level is the there's the part of a, a lake, lake or a pond in which the sunlight can penetrate. Beyond that, the sunlight can't penetrate and you just stop getting plants. You'll get fish, bacteria, um, a whole range of aquatic invertebrates, a whole range of things that live below that photic zone, but you won't get plants. So it's important with a pond, because they're half metre and a half, maybe two metres at most, they tend to be mainly in the photic zone, so the sunlight can penetrate to the bottom. So you're generally going to get plant life across the whole of the pond. Now in some cases this is okay, in other cases the pond can quite quickly get dominated by one or two plants. And then you need to sort of think about is that okay, isn't that okay, am I happy with that or not, and that's some of the things we saw earlier. So you've got the a zone from dry to wet, and then also you've got this photic layer that kind of influences where those plants occur. So some of the ponds, some of the, the uh, plants we've obviously got beautiful. I used to, I grew up in a house with a weeping willow. We didn't have a pond, but we had a weeping willow in the garden. It was fantastic. It was obviously a little wet patch. Um, Sweeney Fen, just down the road from me, has got uh, water ravens in it. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous little plant, very delicate, very pretty. Um, I go to my closest set of, of ponds uh, and water bodies and pools is on the Montgomery Canal and they have loads of orchids on the damp grassland beside the ponds and I know they're there because it, the soil types right uh, and it's wet and moist in that spot. Absolutely beautiful in, in late June. And then the order, it's got those kind of red um, fibrous roots don't mind being in water and um, they look kind of weird uh, and sort of almost organic sort of fleshy type things um, but orders are just gorgeous and very pretty beside the water and they cast a bit of shade they keep the water cool uh, and with a bit of care they will coppice quite nicely so you can manage them um, if you don't want large plants or you want to reduce the shade over a coppicing cycle so every five, seven years, come back and just coppice it and reduce it again. They've got catkins, which attract a whole range of, uh, of, of, of flying insects. So really nice sort of um, set of, of plants that are quite near ponds. So they don't need to be inundated with water, but they're close by. As you start to move into the margins, you have your, your reed mace in the bottom right. They're actually, it's quite an invasive plant the, with its cigar shaped um, seed heads, but there is there is actually a, a variety, a small variety uh, of the typha that can be grown that's slightly less invasive. So if you're planning a planting scheme, you can get the smaller, less invasive reed mace rather than the, the, the common one that can, that can get a bit carried away. So the common reed mace really one for your much larger ponds. Um, top, top left is the water plantain, lovely marginal plant. Um, can tolerate the water kind of being drawn away during that sort of later period of the year. Amphibious bistal uh, quite literally says what it is, it, it quite happily tolerates being in a little bit of water um, with its beautiful pink flowers or will float as a bit of a raft, slightly outer in shallower water. And yellow flag iris, big bold uh, flower, really attractive to pollinators, uh, makes a really nice show. Again, my, my local sort of water pond is, is the canal and it, 
it springs up in tufts along the canal grate, grate in the in the later summer as those big sort of knobbly uh, seed pods. So slightly wetter, um, we have a reed canary grass at the top there. There's loads of different grasses, obviously including the larger grasses like the common reed, um, sort of a metre and a half, sometimes two metres tall. Really beautiful structural plant, will slowly spread. You don't need to, sometimes it's, you get lured into the instant effect trap, whereas actually planting just a couple of common reeds um, better in plugs just plant them into the soft mud they need a little bit of water over them um, probably now is a good time or a little bit slightly later in in uh, in the closing parts of the winter uh, and they will slowly spread really good if you're creating a new pond and you want a bit of structure to it at the back of the pond the thing in the uh, the left that looks like uh, some sort of mop headed punk thing um, that's a tufted sedge creates fantastic cover for um, lovely pond-like birds like wrens will nest inside that, water voles, um, beautiful fronds, lovely shape. Bottom left is another one of the sedges, that's the pond sedge. One of my favourite sedges is the remote sedge, Carex remota. Really tiny, really pretty, um, very subtle and I tend to find it in ponds that are in woodlands that are just on the, the edge of disappearing you find little tufts of Carex remota just in there. And then the main picture is, is branch burr reed, a real firework of a plant, uh, has its foot in water all the time. We're actually found along uh, sort of flowing water courses as well. Uh, but again, really quite a spectacular plant and provides a really good um, emergent platform for um, dragonflies and damselflies to emerge and, and hatch from their exuviae from superb little plant so these guys have got even more of themselves in water you've got the the nymphia the new the, the the lilies loads of decorative versions of those and there is a native variety as well um their their plant the leaves underwater tend to be very floppy um it's it's quite a characteristic of a lot of aquatic plants that their their subsurface leaves tend to be uh, quite floppy, but when they, when they surface, they tend to be far more rigid. So have a look at a, a lily again, you'll notice it's got these floppy sort of boiled cabbage leaves beneath the surface. And then above you have the pad, much more stiff pad capturing sunlight because it can on the surface, whereas below the water, it has to bend with the flow. If it was stiff below the water, it would tend to break. Whereas if it floats on the top, it can be much stiffer. Um, that beautiful sort of, um, it's, it's more of a sort of wedding cake decoration. That's a uh, bog bean. Um, there's a lovely place called Danson Farm that's got a beautiful collection of ponds. And one of the ponds is covered in bog bean, superb flower and, and quite big actually as a flower. A lot of um, wild plants um, tend to have much more modest flowers than the, the cultivated varieties. Bottom left is arrowhead. Uh, distinctive leaf shape and that's a, a very much an emergent um, nice little patch on the Newport Canal that one and then bottom right is our floating sweet grass um, and very common in particularly um, ponds that are in sort of pastures or meadow grounds and you'll see slowly the the, the floating sweet grass the glyceria will extend itself out across the pond quite happily doing that. Other grasses won't do that but this will do that um, and in terms of diagnosing or IDing it if you pick a, one of the the fronds and you go to the end the end of the the grass is joined like the keel of a boat uh, into the prow and if you run your fingers up you'll feel it pop as you come out of the end and all of the sweet grasses have got this kind of prow of the boat end to the the grass the the strap leaf tip here we are, we kind of submerged now. Um, top left, we got a water soldier, a very unusual plant, um, native in the east of the country, but in this area, an invasive. And during the winter, it will sit at the bottom of the pond. And then during the summer, the plant rises up um, and sits on the surface to flower and complete its um, reproductive cycle. And then in the winter, it will sink back to the bottom 
quite an unusual cycle, um, but on, on certainly on the Montgomery Canal, where it's a triple SI, I saw them there on uh, Sunday when I was pottering about. Um, it's an invasive plant because it will occupy the whole of the surface of the water and exclude light from uh, plants beneath it. Top, top right, we have the water crowfoot, um, a number of, of species within this family, member of the buttercup family. And there you can see the surface leaves. Below the, the leaves are more needle-like, much softer uh, and more flow if you've got a little bit of flow in the water. Um, bottom left, hornwort. You'll need one of these. Now where's my... Ah, there it is. Sorry. I was kind of prepared. You'll need a hand lens. But if you use a hand lens and have a look at the hornwort, you'll see it has little horns on, on, the, on the, the needle-like fronds on those whorls, which kind of gives the game away. But that's a submerged plant. Um, another, well, I've got this, this is a, a magnifying pot. Great part, put it in your, your pond kit. And then on the, on the bottom right, we have Canadian pondry, very common. And a lot of these plants have whorls. So the Canadian pondry, has three leaflets per whorl uh, and other plants like the milfoil have got more uh, and that kind of helps you with your sort of diagnostic, diagnostic ID route so just to start to separate them out. Um, now unfortunately this, this is a, a rogues gallery this particular slide so top left we have New Zealand stone crop um, it's a partial succulent it's very tiny that's a much magnified picture um, highly invasive uh, and will cover a pond and will form a thick mat about so thick if not further um, that you can quite literally chop out with a spade and lift chunks out on the top right you've got a plant called a zola or water fern um, and actually the water fern is the red thing so when water fern is under stress when it's a bit cold um, or the water quality is poor, uh, it tends to go red. And again, it's an invasive plant. Now mingled in with the water fern is the duckweed. So the, so the green flat leaves, they have a little single root that hangs down. Well, some of the duckweeds do, they're not all single rooted. There's more than one duckweed. Um, uh, slightly different, but they also tend to, to dominate a pool. Uh, and they tend to create a complete film across the top of the water which excludes light from lower down. And that exclusion of sunlight will cause a problem in terms of nutrient cycling uh, and uh, it will outcompete other plants. So water fern is a bit of an issue. Bottom left, Japanese knotweed, um, extremely tenacious, will follow water courses and will dominate a pond environment. And then of course, uh, Himalayan balsam to bottom right. Attractive, great for pollinators, uh, absolute disaster for, for native plants that are trying to, to, to find a space along water courses, particularly around a pond. And all of these will dominate your pond to the exclusion of all other species. So moving on from our plants, so that was just a, a little taste. There's a lot more to be said about plants, a lot more plants that we could describe, but I think we've, we've, got, we've got to fit in quite a lot. Um, so if I take a cup of water, I've got my my measuring jug taken out of the, the thing. If I had a microscope and I prepared a slide, um, I'd probably see a few larger creatures as I drove, as I magnified down. Um, but then I'd start to encounter this incredible um, range of shapes, sizes, uh, and forms. And these are diatoms. And these particular microorganisms are found in all aquatic environments and in soils. They are photosynthesizing, so they produce oxygen. Um, they will sink. Um, they tend not to be mobile. So you, you've got other creatures will have a, a flagellum. They'll whip it around and they ever move about. Um, but diatoms tend not to. Um, and they don't consume organic matter, so they have a, quite a different relationship. But they are sensitive to nutrient levels in the pond um, or in any water body. And you'll get different communities of diatoms depending on the water chemistry and the composition of your pond. So at a, at a microscopic level, each pond will have a slightly different community of diatoms in it. 
So for those of you that have got a microscope or a hankering to, to regenerate that, that knowledge from that biochemistry degree you did donkeys years ago, um, it's a really nice field to get in, really interesting, and they're very, 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 very appealing. So that's your diatoms, they're there in, in your pond and they occupy in the billions and billions. Next one up, equally quite simple, uh, are algae. Um, they're in pretty much all aquatic environments. They are unicellular, um, but they tend to team up to fire into, to form much bigger um, sort of bodies. So your blanket weed is an algae and it's, it's loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of unicellular um, organisms have come together to form these larger mats or, or masses. So I won't go on to that because I don't know an awful lot about it, but I, I know they're there and I appreciate that they're around. And I also appreciate as an organic uh, content, particularly in nutrient enriched environments, they can be a bit of a problem because if you've got too much nutrients, you end up with algae. When algae break down, let's say overnight, um, and you get a bit of a sort of a turnover in nutrients, they can actually strip oxygen out of your pool. If you've got too much, that sort of late September window is a good opportunity to remove some of it, pop it on the bank so that any animals that are using it as shelter or forage can crawl back into the pond. But too much of it is indicative of a nutrient issue. And a lot of new ponds will tend their first flourish as they're attempting, as they're working towards a balance, will include a bit of a flush or, or a bloom of algae. And particularly when water temperatures are high, you'll get an algal bloom, uh, and that can be a bit of a challenge to, to address. And certainly for larger pools that have got fish in, an algae problem can be, be a, a management challenge to keep things working. Um, these cyanobacteria, the bluegin algae, are very common. Um, and again, they, they affect or are indicative of nutrient cycling, and some of them are toxic. So certainly shouldn't the water shouldn't be ingested, or you might want to keep the dog out of the pond. Good idea keeping your dogs out of ponds anyway. Uh, a lot of uh, flea treatments are just uh, are insecticides, obviously, because they uh, a flea is an insect, and they will wash off into ponds. And there's a growing body of evidence that that flea treatments. Um, are having an impact on, on aquatic invertebrates from dogs having chasing a stick, uh, having a swim. It's all sort of innocent activities that have got these funny, odd little unintended consequences. So, but they, blue green algae are toxic and we, we've got to be careful about that. They're, again, they're indicative of uh, an imbalance in terms of temperature and nutrient. Um, another big group, I, I bought a huge guide a few years ago. I, Occasionally I put it off the shelf and then I reluctantly put it back again because it's far too complicated for me. Um, but mosses are just absolutely gorgeous under a lens. Um, they're a beautiful addition and will grow on all sorts of substrate, whether it's rocks or wood um, or in water. There's free floating uh, mosses. Liverworts like a damp environment and there's a whole range of those, a really interesting um, group to get into. Uh, and the creation of a pond tends to create a, a microclimate in which these water dependent organisms will thrive. Uh, and certainly over time, that moss covered rock in the corner of the thing is harboring a whole range of bacteria and much smaller organisms um, that any amount of, of sort of manipulative gardening just won't achieve. So allowing mosses uh, free reign is, is a fantastic idea. Um, it's untidiness at a tiny scale, and they really are beautiful in terms of structure and, and shape or form. Okay, so our aquatic invertebrates, I've got a few slides just to identify the kind of the main groups uh, of, of, of things that we're most likely to encounter using our pond. Um, these are the mayfly. Ultimately, the, the adult versions will, will fly, they form um, they have a two-stage development. They become uh, what they call a dung, um, and then the dung uh, resheds its skin and becomes the, the adult or the spinner. Um, I've just illustrated two 
basic types of mayfly larvae in this image. There's a, there's a third called um, that's a flattened mayfly, but they tend to be found in moving water situations. But these two here, this is uh, a betis, which is the swimming mayfly. That's the main picture. Um, all mayfly have three tails. So the, the adult, the flying version has three tails and the larvae have three tails. The small inset picture is of a burrowing mayfly. Um, and I suppose I probably should have swapped them around because the burrowing mayfly has much more obvious external gills. So halfway along its body it has two um, paired little sort of light brown things sticking out, little of appendages. And when you look under them under a lens in, in a spoon of water, you'll see those appendages just pulsing. And these are external gills collecting oxygen from the water. Uh, they, the, uh, the swimming mayfly have them, but they tend to be concealed a little bit tighter around the body. But the burrowing are adapted to live in uh, gravel and loose stones or sand. So they need their gills a little bit larger and a bit more uh, protruding. But they do pulse and they're, they're absolutely fascinating. So they, they will spend you know, quite a long part of their life cycle in water, um, feeding and, and, and browsing and grazing. And here's the adult. So as I said, the, the dun tends to be a, a paler colour and then the spin of that final form, the mayfly, this ephemeral short-lived adult uh, is the spinner, much clearer colours, more defined in terms of its final form. And again, I mean, this evening we're really just introducing you to these guys. Uh, and it's obviously there's a big journey ahead for all of us this year uh, when we get out and about again. Um, damselflies, uh, fantastic. I got, you've got a mating pair in the bottom left there. I've watched, I found a pond I was over near um, St. Martin's and was watching these joined up beautiful demoiselles spinning across the water. And if you look closely, you could see the, the eggs splashing into the water as they laid them. There's a little sort of skittering effect as they laid the eggs just to settle into the water. Um, and later on, they'll obviously hatch to become these larvae. The larvae are quite aggressive, um, but that's okay. Uh, they've got to fit in somewhere. But one of the things that I noticed about this particular, this particular picture, I've, I chose it deliberately because the, the, the damselfly larvae have what they call lamella. So these are these tails at the back. And you notice on this particular one, it's striped. So it has, uh, it goes black, cream, cream, uh, black, cream, white, black, cream. So it's striped. And on each of the species of Demoiselle damselfly, there's a different coding on the lamella. So you can, as a, as a sort of non-specialist, if you get one of those in there, you can actually work out what species it's going to turn into, what adult it's going to turn into. And I thought when I realised, when I found that out, that was a couple of years back, I was just really excited by that. It made me feel slightly less thick. Because uh, I normally stare at this stuff going, I don't know what you are, but you, you're just wonderful. Um, but that was quite a nice little window into that, which is cool. The other thing you can do, um, I've, I've illustrated this, uh, one of my favourites is the blue-tailed damselfly. It's my favourite because I can confidently identify it. It's the only one that's got a blue tail with this fantastic stripe around it. But all the other blue damselflies, if you can creep up to them, sometimes you can use a pair of monocular, either monocular or binoculars. If you look at just that, that first little patch just behind the back of their head, it tends to have a little giveaway stripe on it. And that can be sufficient to allow you to identify what it is. Um, I just picked up this little ID card to show you. So again, the blue, the blue of flash is great. They will stop. They won't stop very close to you unless you're very, very still. But I think that encourages you just to stay still and see if you can just get a good view of the back of that, just behind the head there. And they've got those slight different variations in pattern uh, and in, in coding that allow us to identify the damselflies. And having good, good amounts of emergent vegetation uh, and structure to a pond uh, is a fantastic thing. They do need a little bit of open water to hunt across, 
um, but they need that emergent vegetation, that link between their aquatic life cycle and their aerial one is key. Dragonflies, I mentioned them earlier, they, they do make a heck of a racket. Um, and I really quite like the, the, big, the big brown hawk on the left because it's, it's the, the only brown dragonfly in this country, Aetna grandis. It's really nice and easy to identify because it is the only brown one. Um, the emperors, which is the top right, I do find really tricky because they all look slightly the same uh, and some of them are quite rare but also look quite the same. But fantastic things, they're big, they're noisy, they're, they're larvae in, in the water, incredibly aggressive. They don't have tails, lamella like the damselflies, they tend to be bigger. You can also, when they climb up on a piece of emergent vegetation, and when they crack the back and emerge as adults, for a brief while, they're very vulnerable. They tend to be, get picked off by swallows or, or martins or sand martins. But if they can make it, they'll stretch out their wings and slowly colour up over the rest of that particular sunny summer day. But they will leave their exuvia, their case behind, and you can collect them. There's a lovely pond at Dolgoth Quarry, one of our reserves, um, and you can watch them emerge and you can collect the exuvia once they finish with them, obviously, um, not before. And the exuvia are different for different species. And again, it's, it's a little, it's not, it's not a cul-de-sac, it's a doorway. You've got to treat this as a doorway into a wonderful world. Uh, and you can ex and identify what might be flying, what might be behind you making that awful racket as it comes across hunting for smaller prey. These are an, an example of Hemiptera. So these are bugs. So Hemiptera bugs are a huge family, um, but some of these bugs have adapted to aquatic environments. Quite a lot of them use the surface tension to move around like the water cricket, the pond skater and the water measurer. The measurer tends to be quite deliberate in its movements, where the Geris, the pond skater, much more energetic, really going some to maintain its position on the water. Saucer bugs are quite different. And then the water boatmen, I just love their adaptation, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and in the centre, I've, I've just got a little picky of the water scorpion. Tends to be slow and deliberate, quite tolerant of relatively low oxygen levels, but has a large extension to its rear end, this kind of spike, which is a needle, and it'll reach up to the surface of the water and just draw down a little bubble of air from time to time to top itself up. Great, a really good group, really good fun. And then I put this in because I, I've got, you've got weaknesses, haven't you? You've got to identify, what's your weaknesses? My weaknesses is I could never identify which one's which. So one of them swims upside down, the back swimmer, no connector. One of them swims up the right way, the lesser water boatman, Carixa. I've got back swimmers in our pond in the garden I don't have the other one, the Carixa. So I've done that in, sorry, imposing my ignorance on you, but I've just got to keep reminding myself what the difference is between those two. Uh, I'm going to turn this off now and immediately forget, but there we go. Um, moving on a little bit, moths. There's thousands of moths, but only a few of them have got aquatic larvae, aquatic caterpillars, and one of those is the China Mark moth of which this is an example. And the China mark moth caterpillar um, will cut out a couple of little semicircles of water lily leaf and will stick to the, together around itself as a little pod while it completes its life cycle. I just think that's just wonderful. You know, really adapted to do those sorts of things. So you, you may find the adult flying about um, and certainly a pond is a super place to set up a moth trap. But you also you may find the, the young, the little caterpillar there, just poddling about in its little water lily case that it's carefully constructed for itself. Moths, brilliant. Caddis flies, um, normally associated with rivers. You think, oh yeah, caddis flies are low. But there's a huge variety of caddises in, in pools. You can draw the caddis flies to a moth trap of an evening. Um, and one way to tell uh, the caddis apart is they have tiny little spurs on their legs. Can't really pull them out in this picture, but they have different combinations. They might have no spur, 
Then the middle set of legs has two spurs per leg and the back leg is four spurs. Tiny, only sort of millimetre long, little, little extra hairs. Each species of caddis um, has a larvae that makes it, is either caseless or has a net, a, a very gentle type net, or has a case. And each species makes its case in a different way. Fantastic, great. Um, even bigger family, the two winged flies. And I think, of, oh yeah, I managed to pick a picture. So the main picture, dipteras, the, the, the two winged flies, only have two wings, but they have just behind the wing, where the wing joins the body, they have two little structures called hortairs. And these hortairs help balance the, the fly in, in the air. And in slow motion, those hortairs kind of wobble backwards and forwards or spin or oscillate. And they create. So in, in bees and wasps, which have uh, four wings, they don't need the hortair because they've got an extra set of wings to help them balance as they fly. But all of the two wing flies have this additional mechanism to help them balance. It's a big group. And obviously most of them, or a large amount of them, have aquatic larvae. Um, so your mosquitoes being the most classic one of that. And they will, will, will lay their eggs in water, even in sort of rock pockets in, in, in a tree. But a pond is clearly going to offer loads of opportunities for the, the two winged flies to complete their life cycle. Um, huge group, there's about, I think it's about 400 um, aquatic beetles in this country. Each pond will have its own unique community. Um, this includes the whirly gig beetle. Um, bottom right, we have a scavenging beetle larvae. They're quite aggressive, the larvae. And in the bottom center, that's a great diving beetle with its beautiful um, yellowy gold fringe to its shell. The elytra, which is this hard substance that forms a shell, is split in two and they will have, a, have wings underneath those. So they all fly. So again, with your newly created pond, it's there rather like a duck. Um, water beaters will find it. We don't need to bring them from somewhere else. They will find it and they'll occupy it. Rather like the lesser water boatman in our, in our pool in the garden. I didn't bring them there. They, they found it themselves. They can fly uh, and they arrived. Fortunately, um, for us, as we're struggling with all these things to learn and things to identify, there is actually only one aquatic water spider in the country called the water spider. Um, and that's in the main picture. And on top left, it, it will collect air and form bubbles. because It's still dependent on air. Um, but top right, we have the fen raft spider. So you have spiders that are adapted to aquatic environments, but they tend not to be subsurface. And then bottom right is one of the wolf spiders that will quite happily use the surface tension to move around hunting for prey, but not strictly an aquatic spider. So a nice group, um, obviously part of the, the active food chain there doing their bit. Slightly smaller <laughs> are the water mites. Tend either a hand lens or a microscope to spot these. Quite deliberate, slow moving little creatures, parasitic. On, on larger organisms, um, but a quite a nice interesting group and again don't have to do a lot, they will find uh, the pond really really easily and all by themselves. Um, slightly less attractive to some but I think they're quite fast, they look like little kittens with their little ears. Um, these are the flat worms, underneath them they have tiny hairs along the surface of their body and these will pulsate and move. So these cilia will help them kind of move across surfaces uh, as if they're gliding. Um, they're not the same as leeches, so they don't, they can't expand to greater size. They tend to, they're quite flexible in terms of the shape, but they tend to remain relatively constrained in size. The leeches can stretch their bodies um, to a great degree, but flatworms don't. Um, and again, you'll find them and they're all part of the, the kind of food chain they will eat um, sort of debris and, and, and detritus in the pond, which is an important function because without these doing that, your pond will just fill up with organic matter uh, and, and it will be job done. It will be over for the pond. So we need these kind of characters as well.
Um, something else, these are, as I didn't realize until I got, did a bit of reading earlier this year, what a huge field ectoparasites are. So these are parasites that are um, internal to, to fish and other things. And there's just loads and loads and loads and loads of them. Sometimes they're a symptom of <coughs> poor water quality. Other times they're just present in small number anyway. And certainly for some of them will cause problems in livestock, um, in dogs uh, and, and domestic pets. So again, it's an issue about your decision making around the pond. Uh, they will be present in small number. If water quality declines, you may get an outbreak of, of fluke. Uh, and if you've got livestock or pets or have an access to the water, an unfortunate consequence, maybe they will pick up fluke, fluke based infections. Something to think about. <coughs> As mentioned earlier, we have the leech. Um, despite going out of favour for a couple of hundred years, they've returned to the, the field of surgical medicine. Um, they're, they're used extensively in, in major surgery because they will actually keep blood flowing. So they will prevent premature healing of wounds because they need to, for whatever purposes, need to keep the wound um, open and, and move into to, to reduce infection. So inter interesting, so the medicinal leech is now back on the market. Uh, grab, buy a bucket if you wish. Um, but the, the horse leech is out there. Um, again, it's got that role, it will eat um, dying um, organisms elsewhere in the food chain. And we, we need this range of things. And interesting, we had one in a spoon. Um, we're just holding the spoon and the leech was in the spoon. And as we passed our finger by it, the, the leech kind of lent out, extended itself out, was following the finger. So it's obviously detecting chemicals, heat, uh, and it can, it can kind of detect and sense there's something present. That was just really interesting, sort of simple experiment. So clearly, like most other creatures, if not all of them, they can smell. Fish have got a great sense of smell, for instance. They can actually detect their uh, things that are in their environment and move towards them. So beware when you fall over drunk into your pond, the leeches are after you. Other less savoury, or well, maybe more savoury, I don't know. Um, I've noticed this recently in my um, exploration down on, on the canal that some of the fish that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at have been infected by fish lice. This tend, they, fish lice rather like other creatures, this particular one's called Argolus, tend to be around anyway. Fish have all sorts of parasites will occupy their, their gills, will hang on. You've got things like anchor worms will, will grip on. But in, in overcrowded conditions when you've got too many fish, or the water quality is poor as well, uh, is you will get an outbreak of fish lice and it, it tends to, it will make the, your fish sluggish, unhealthy, um, they won't feed, they'll be more prone to predation or to attack from other diseases. Uh, and rather like uh, trees and ourselves, they are prone to illnesses, diseases, bacterial and fungal infections. They're living creatures um, and, and trees and fish and ourselves and other creatures are are all part of a, a constant sort of battle and struggle. So fish lice will be present if you've got fish, they'll be present if they're not, um, they'll be looking for other hosts. But again, they're part of that just incredible wealth of things that are, are in the pond. Um, this is a little slide of uh, copepods, <clears throat> which are our tiny crustaceans, crustaceans, I get that right, and occur in colossal numbers and things like fish fry, once their mouths have started to open, will feed on copiapods in great quantity. And um, they're kind of part of the food chain, uh, a form of sustenance. But again, you know, a, a form of, of, of great source of investigative joy and pleasure. So slightly bigger in the crustacean department, we have fairy shrimps, brine shrimps, tadpole shrimps, clams, we have water hog louse. So they've got an exoskeleton, multiple legged, um, and in the center, Daphnia. Daphnia tend to have a tiny little bit of color, like a little bit of brick red color in them. So when they're tiny, um, you'll notice, and if they're in a great shoal of them, you'll notice the water goes slight brown color. Um, and by actually lifting, you know, popping a net in and pouring it into your tray, 
you'll, you'll find actually the color isn't the water at all. The water's clear. You just got this incredible effusion of Daphnia swimming about. Great food source for other things in the water um, and obviously part of the food chain. Uh, and a good, you know, a good sign that the, the, the pond's got sufficient food to feed all sorts of creatures um, left, right and centre. Uh, freshwater crayfish. In the centre we have the, the white clawed, the native variety. Uh, they will occupy ponds, they like a good pond and they'll burrow into the banks. Unfortunately, um, just as a, a, a warning, on the top left we have the red signal, this is the American red signal crayfish, which is an invasive, carries a plague that's had a catastrophic impact on the white crayfish, which are legally protected because they're under such pressure. But you might find them in the pond. They can crawl across the ground, so they're, they're not constrained by distance from traveling from one place to another. So they might come over and colonize the new pond. Fantastic, just huge body. I'm not just to illustrate just a few of these, just to kind of get us started. You will have limpets, and limpets will attach not just to rocks and stones, but they'll stick on to plants. A lot of times, uh, fetching out the branch burr reed, you just have a look and you'll find lower down below the water level, there'll be limpets just stuck to it, or, or pond snails of all sorts of sizes. Uh, and just starting point for snails, some of them are sinister, they twist left, and some are dexterous and they twist right. And that's quite a nice way of starting to split them apart. And others are the ram's horn. So you've got a large, great ram's horn in the center there or some like this twisted ram's horn, uh, they have, they're lacking in melanin, so they actually tend to be a bit red because they're showing their, their blood through the, through the shell. Uh, superb array, but some ponds may actually only contain just a few ponds, or of course you've got this lovely terrestrial habitat, that rough grassland that you've left around the pond, and that'll have a whole range of terrestrial species. The Demulan world snail, famous from the failed attempt to stop another ill-advised uh, bypass project years ago down near Winchester. It tends to be found in damp grasslands near pools. So it's a kind of a marginal habitat, but it does attract rarities, not necessarily an aquatic snail, but an important and rare one. So here we got a few more. These are clams, bivalves, so they've got two shells. Swan mussels, quite common in in larger water bodies, so they like it sort of soft ground, um, unlike the, the shingle that particular one's displayed on. Um, pearl mussels can again be found, um, and then there's a whole range. Again, it's a sort of huge group of different sizes and shapes. Just one slide on fish. I thought we've got a three spined, a nine spined. I haven't put the 15 spined up, that's quite an unusual fish, but that tends to be in brackish or marine habitats, one of the uh, native sticklebacks. So a lot of ponds may end up with um, a couple of small fish in. Um, the bottom left is a stone loach, tends not to be seen during the day, skulks around in the muddy bottom of the pond. But if your pond's quite old and it may have a resident pike lurking in it, and it's important to, to recognise the presence of a predator is okay, it's all right. It may claim the odd duckling, You've got to go with that. It may claim the odd fish, it may, it may eat the few things, but actually what it tends to do, more importantly, it maintains a balance in the pond. Having a good old fashioned, lazy, tired pike, sort of, sort of hanging around, waiting in ambush, is actually the right thing to do. If we remove that big old pike from the pond, what we get is loads of little pike. We get loads and loads of jack pike, and those jack pike will devastate the population of everything else in the pond. So a large pike will eat every now and then, and then it will hang around for quite a while. It will tend to pick off much larger other fish or prey, and then it will hang around for a while digesting. It doesn't eat an awful lot across the, the range of a year. So having that large pike in there, brilliant. Having loads and loads of jack pike fighting, eating each other, eating everything else is, that's going on, 
is a bad idea. <clears throat> so though it's tempting to, 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 to fiddle with the balance by removing large predators, what it tends to have is a, is a concatenation effect on the, the balance within the rest of the pond. So it, it, it runs counter, it's kind of counterintuitive to what we think we should be doing, but it, it, it's really good evidence backs that up is, is that we need that single big old predator just to help maintain the balance in the pond uh, and disturbing that balance can actually have a detrimental effect. Anyway, fish, big topic. So I've put in one slide and I think if we're gonna do fish, we'll do it another time, we'll do it properly. Um, one of my first experiences of seeing a grass snake up close was watching something swim across the pond and realize it was a grass snake. Absolutely fantastic, really distinctive patterning, that fantastic cream stripe across the back of its neck and that strong black patching. Um, it will hunt out tadpoles and frogs and other prey. Um, and I just, I have, I've got a list of credits for all these photographs. I just don't put them on. I haven't got enough time, I'm afraid, but I'd just like to thank everybody who's contributed to photographs this evening. And this one is just a wonder. Top right, we have a different sort of reptile. This is a red uh, next terrapin. Um, it tends to be abandoned. Uh, there's one lives in the Newport Canal. Uh, there's one in another pond in, in Telford. Um, and, and that's quite a shame. They're long lived. Um, they really shouldn't be out. They, they tend to be a bit voracious and they, they do disrupt our natural systems. Um, but I do know in, in the past that Blue Planet out of Chester would um, rehome them quite nicely for us. But they are present around. One slide for amphibians, because <clears throat> each, each amphibian's got this fantastic story to tell about their reproductive cycle, about the fact that the frogs have got spawn in big blobby patches, toads lay spawn in strings, and newts put their spawn in individual eggs onto leaves, and then they wrap the leaf carefully around the, the egg. Fantastic. Different reproductive strategies. All of them are dependent on a pond that's got lots going on in it. Um, top right, we've got the great crested newt. Um, not particularly rare in this country, but globally it is. We, we kind of look after the global population, which is why it's a protected species. Not because it's rare, but because we're it, its neighborhood. This is where its patch is. In the middle, we have the palmate newt, which is less common. Um, and its diagnostic is it's a tiny little needle tail. So it's quite different and it's very small. And then the bottom, though bright and as cheery as the great crested newt, this is a male smooth newt, which is roughly half the size maybe of the great crested newt, so much smaller. Um, but newts need a little bit of open water in the pond. They don't need it to completely open because they've got to shelter their young and they need those, those aquatic plants. But they, they have a display and a courtship so they will do a, a, a kind of a swimming display dance in order to attract a mate. So the, the amphibian requirements are slightly different across the, the toads and the frogs and the newts, but a bit of open water is really quite good for the newts and they need those emergent plants. Anyway, that's enough on amphibians because I'm aware that the clock is running. A few mammals, um, water shrew, not very often seen, um, there are in present in Shropshire. Um, they're insectivorous like all of the other shrews. They eat invertebrates. They can swim. They're adapted to swim. Um, they're not particularly good swimmers, but they can swim. The, the Bentons is known as the water bat because it tends to swoop over ponds. And if you get that balance between um, rich, verdant, marginal vegetation, loads of terrestrial habitat, loads of stuff going in the pond, then you'll get loads of flying insects, which is what the bats need. They can eat up to 10,000 um, insects, I think is it over at night or over a year? Can't remember one of which, but it's hundreds and hundreds anyway in a sitting overnight in the evening as they're flying around. Brilliant insect control, sort of predator control for, for insects, but 
they're also great to see. Now we have um, pipistrels around our, our house. We saw the first of them just a couple of weeks ago. There was a little bit of lifting in the temperature. It's quite a warm day. Uh, and they'd be out there taking advantage of that, those, those invertebrates on the wing. And later in the year, when you get your May bugs, which is sort of clumsy, um, some of the bats will have to knock them out of the sky because they're too heavy to, to eat them in flight. Um, others, the larger bats, can actually manage a May fly in flight, a May bug, sorry, in flight, um, and actually consume it while they're still in flight. So bats drawn to ponds because they're such um, oases of, of uh, aerial uh, invertebrate life. You will get brown rats. Um, they they are very common. Um, they will ferret around. They're looking for food and stuff like that. And it really depends on on your view on rats, on what other things you've got going on in your sort of domestic setup as to as to how you respond to those. Um, deal with them humanely. We we do. We have chickens, so that that's that's an issue for us. Um, but we're we're aware that our pond gives them a source of water like it does for many other wildlife. Um, but we have to target the, the brown rat humanely in order to maintain a bit of biosecurity around our, our flock of chickens. It's a, it's a real, real issue. Um, and obviously you get much larger animals like deer in, in the open countryside will use ponds as a source of water and will come down to the edge rather like you see an exotic African a uh, wildlife documentary of the gazelle coming down to the watering hole uh, is we do the same thing. Um, it's not as exotic, it's not as hot, but it is equally important that we provide these drinking holes. Um, I had a nice chat with, with, a, with a, a, a friend today about water voles. They, they have them present on their pond. Water voles need a wide range of vegetation types for them to eat, to chew. They have little gardens that they tend. They build burrows and their burrow systems by the edge of water. They will leave latrines. They're incre incredibly tidy. Uh, and I think it's one of the wonders of, of the UK that we can, we can have actually a colony of water voles. Uh, they are in, in mainly in North Shropshire, um, but the more ponds and water courses that we can manage sensitively, let's hope we can reverse some of the um, appalling declines that they've experienced over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Don't have a tail or have a tiny little tail and their ears are tucked into their fur, unlike rats. Rats uh, don't have furry tails, they're much longer and they tend to be much bigger. So water voles will quite happily use uh, a pond uh, and, and certainly a lot of the locations in which they're recorded in Shropshire are ponds rather than, than ditches and water courses. Um, equally at home in a, in a pond is an otter. They have very large territories uh, and will travel considerable distances across land to get to, to ponds. They will use larger ponds as breeding kind of natal areas for to bring up their kits before returning them to the water course uh, and certainly a wonder. And you know if you've got a real good array of habitat types and maybe a lovely soft gentle sloping edge to your pond which has got a bit of soft ground you stand a good chance of picking up the prints from otters that have been exploring your pond um, and another little fix is to leave a large rock just into the water so it, it forms a little island and that can be used to collect spring it's not really for the otters for territorial marking um, but for us, we can actually collect sprain and other records of what's visited the, the pond. Um, though you may also encounter mink, highly mobile predator, invasive, um, part of the, the weasel and uh, badger family, a mustelid like the otter. Slightly larger pond, oh actually not true, so even quite small ponds will have a resident coot or a moorhen sort of paddling away. Um, swans may take over and build one of their island breeding nests in a corner. Um, there's a my closest, the closest one in my head I can remember is one that was just tucked into a housing estate which had a pond and there was a space between gardens where there was a pool uh, and a, a swan had built a very large and substantial perennial nest there that it fended with, with hisses and, and flaps of its wings. 
uh, and then the bottom left is is the is a widgeon, a couple of a, a pair of widgeon. So you get your waterfowl will quite happily occupy it. A lot of ducks actually um, um, nest in trees, so providing um, nest boxes for ducks in in your local trees is a nice idea as well. Tend to be much larger holes or or a bit of a platform, and then you'll see the the mallards later on when the the females got ready for fledging will lead the ducks down or the ducklings down to the pond uh, for the next time for the next cycle of their adolescence. Um, just two waders this is a green shank at the top um, hanging around and then in flight and then below is a snipe um, again in flight just to show the difference both of which easily confused but you got that flash of the the rump of the the green shank as it heads off and then the snipe is much smaller <clears throat> and tends to be more dart like as it, it flips really, really quickly. They also tend not to fly very high. They stay quite low as they head off. Love the soft edge, you know, that, that long straight bill is, is there to, to, to ferret around in soft um, um, materials around the edges of pools and, uh, and ponds. So you, you'll, you'll, you'll be lucky to to encounter a wader or two. It depends on the location, that connectivity, where the pond is. But certainly most of the snipe that I flush are, are round pools uh, and shallow ponds. Heron, now, may possibly a controversial, though stately character to add to the party. Um, I don't particularly mind Heron, but if you've got an ornamental pond or an extremely expensive collection of koi carp, the last thing you'll want to see out of the kitchen window is a heron. Um, but there are measures you can take in terms of netting or fencing or whatever to, to carefully and humanely exclude them. Um, but they, they will be attracted. And I think if you're planning a pond and you've got space to make the pond large enough so that the, the community of wildlife in there can support the occasional passing heron, then that's okay. Um, I think it's where you've got a collection um, of, of, of animals that where the, the, the conflict between the heron uh, and the pond owner can get quite intensive. But in a natural setting, a heron calling by, and if there's not a lot there, it, it will fly on. And it also it won't empty the pond. It's not in its interest. All predators, it's not in their interest to eat everything. Um, and it's only the fox when it gets inside the coop uh, behaves against type. Um, it tends to kill all of the chickens in the coop. But that's a completely artificial situation. Whereas in nature, it would just kill one chicken um, and it would leave the rest to, to run off. It's, it's a, we've got to be aware of the, the different situations or statuses in which predators behave to understand. So an open wild pond a grey heron will not sit around day after day emptying and hoovering out. It's not in its interest. It will need to move from pond to pond to make sure it maintains its food supply. So I think somebody described it as zero sum. It's not in a predator's interest is to deprive um, uh, itself of all its forage. Um, and then we're getting closer to the end. I got this sort of action photograph of a kingfisher. Now, most ponds will be unlikely to have uh, a cliff, um, a sandy cliff that will encourage a kingfisher to, to land and start tunneling. That's quite a deep tunnel it creates. But a part, about 50-50 of my kingfisher sightings are on pools and lakes. So even in urban settings over my years of working in Telford, most of my kingfisher sightings are on pools and lakes. Um, and I just see the flash of blue as it runs from one side to the other. And we, we must remember that kingfishers are highly mobile. They're also territorial. And if they find they've got a set of pools and ponds that are close enough, that have got enough that they can forage and move around between, uh, they will create a territory out of that and not just out of a length of attractive um, Wensum or Wye or Stour River bank. Um, so I'm, I've added the, the kingfisher because I think it's an important component. And I think for some of the larger ponds or even smaller ones, the, there will be the occasional flash of a kingfisher. 
um, that will bring a, a bit of a leap in the heart and a, and a jump in the blood pressure. So I'm sorry I've occupied probably far too much of your time and you're probably desperate for a cup of tea but hopefully by now we've covered some of the pitfalls and things to think about when you need to to create a pond um, and when that pond is created by allowing nature time and space and with a bit of patience I've given you some indication of the things that will learn to love and enjoy and inhabit your pond uh, and also some of the things to just to adjust our umvelt so that we see it from a crane fly's point of view. A crane fly doesn't need an acre of water and a crane fly needs so much more than that. And an acre of water in which part of it's a wetland, part of it's um, really, really deep. Some of it's shaded by trees, partly it's got an island in the middle of it. It's got gently sloping banks. Um, and it's got a whole range of stuff. Then that crane fly is going, oh, all right, I'll settle here. I might be food for something else, but I like this spot. This is all right by me. Anyway, um, thank you very much for listening. Now, if we, I think, let me just check the time. Yeah, I think what I do is I'm just going to very quickly, I won't take questions. I think that's, that's far too much of your time. But what I will tell you is we are, we do have a scheme running currently. Um, it's funded by the Nat by Natural England. I have to warn you, it's very heavily oversubscribed currently. But on our web page, we do have a, an email address called rivershub at shropshirewildlifetrust.org.uk. If you have any questions specifically about creating ponds, um, looking after ponds, or something you want to help to identify, then please go there, use that email, and that will come through to me and my team, and we'll do our best to answer your inquiries that way. And then we can give them some, some decent attention and send you some links and information. So what I say is thank you very much for listening in. Um, thank you very much for supporting Shropshire Wildlife Trust and, and the things that we try and do on behalf of wildlife. And uh, if you are planning a pond, or if you've got one, if you've got one, enjoy it. If you're planning one, enjoy that process too, uh, and I look forward to hearing more about it. Okay, take care and uh, safe journey back to the rest of your houses. <laughs>